My hope here today is I want to review the AUA white paper on uh, uh, preoperative optimization for um, uh, getting patients ready for surgery and hopefully give you guys all some good take-home points about how to get good outcomes and to improve patient safety. So why do this paper? Um, I think every surgeon and every actually medical practitioner recognizes this diagram. And this is what we do. We balance patient risk versus trying to optimize our success and our satisfaction for the patients. And the challenge is, is that nobody can know everything about how to get patients ready for surgery. The information is scattered over multiple different areas, and, and how do we compensate for that? We tend to have people who we uh, trust. We have a good anesthesiologist, an excellent preoperative center. Maybe we have a good cardiologist that we trust. But it can be variable, site to site, person to person. And the goal here of the AUA was to kind of create a standardized source for urologists to be able to reference and to actually bring us back into the conversation a little bit more. How can we help optimize the uh, preoperative readiness and postoperative success of our patients? And so to this end, it commissioned uh, three papers. This is from the AUA Quality Improvement and Patient Safety Committee. Um, this was organized by Dr. Kristen uh, uh, Krauser, and it was broken into three sections. There's preoperative, interoperative, and postoperative, and chairs and study sections were uh, uh, created for each one of these. I'm going to talk about the preoperative one here today, and this was the uh, section that, that uh, I helped organize. And for reference, all the papers are at the uh, AUA uh, uh, guideline section there. And so this had some methodology of, uh, uh, attached to it. The literature was reviewed, particularly societal recommendations, key papers, and uh, uh, a work group was created and, and really made recommendations trying to aggregate this based on the evidence and try to be able to put it in a digestible format. Um, we very heavily weighed professional society recommendations here to be able to, again, bring that information accessible to urologists. Uh, there was expert opinion, the opinions that are going to talk a little bit about here based on evidence, and it was peer-reviewed uh, by the AUA. Uh, from what I've been told about the critique panel later on, maybe the peer review will be a little bit easier than what uh, these questions you guys have, but welcome to talk about it. And so the preoperative care here, let's just define it as any and all medical evaluation or treatment received in preparation prior to surgery. And I think that just sets the stage as what we're talking about. And so when we look at preoperative care focus, I really want to talk about four areas here. And the first is something maybe we don't talk about a lot, but it's critically important, I hope to make the case for you here today, is functional status and cognitive status. Second thing I want to talk about major systems, uh, uh, cardiac, pulmonary, vascular, endocrine, and GI. And then we'll finish up talking a little bit about some preoperative rehabilitation, maybe playing on a little bit of the talks that were given earlier about uh, how to rehab before the surgery itself. So let's start, let's start uh, uh, with functional status. Let's talk with frailty. Um, I want people to think about functional status as being part of an assessment for frailty. Normally, when we think of functional status, we just think about what's their cardiac function, how are they short of breath. But really, their overall functional status is really an inclusion of how frail they are. And why is this important? Well, frail patients have been demonstrated repeatedly to be more risk after uh, recovering from surgery. So it really needs to be identified before surgery. And so there are risks for post-operative complications. Uh, they need more rehabilitation uh, uh, care, increased risk of delirium. They have more uh, wound infections. And all this has kind of been shown in multiple uh, uh, different studies across different specialties. But to bring it home and to a urologist here, excellent study here that really showed patients uh, undergoing radical cystectomy frailty more than the anesthesia score was more associated with increased odds of major complications. Again, this has to do with the functional statuses, not just cardiac, not just vascular, not just oncology also. Think about a sling surgery. This is from uh, Dr. Ann Suskin, who was an FPRMS fellow at Michigan, now at UCSF, uh, done a great work studying uh, uh, frailty. She studied 56,000 Medicare patients in a review and classified them into frailty scores. And the moderate, severely frail women had a tremendously high increased risk of complications afterwards by comparison. If you look at that, 56%, 57% had 30-day uh, complications with a relative risk of 2.5, adjusted relative risk 2.5. And look at a, a, a one-year mortality, uh, very, very high. So frailty very much is something that we need to identify beforehand. So tools here, how can we identify frailty? Well, this is a criteria here that has a scoring system that's been studied, but I think they're great questions that everybody can ask and just when you're evaluating your patients. 
um, shrinking. Talk about do they have more than 10 pound weight loss? Are they, do they get tired? Well, maybe everybody gets tired, but in particular, more than what normally is what they had before. Weakness, um, a good way is just ask about grip strength. Can they still open uh, uh, jars? Can they still write with a pencil? Uh, walking speed, I like to see how patients walk to the clinic and see how much adjust, how much help that they need. Um, you can do time tests, but really just an observation is excellent to kind of see how quickly that they're getting there. And then also a daily routine of their assessment. Ask them what they're doing, how, they, how they're functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a score associated with this, but these are great five questions just to be able to look at the uh, status of people and think about frailty as a possible complication that you can avoid or at least prepare for. Involve your, geront your geront uh, uh, gerontology team, and the reference is here for that. Now, cognition is another part of that, which is a little bit different than frailty, but definitely related. Um, cognition tends to uh, present later in life, but it's highly prevalent uh, um, later, and you can see 22% in one study of people over 71. Um, and when you look at your baseline cognitive uh, 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 impairment, um, people who are baseline uh, uh, have impairment tend to have more complications after surgery. And it's really a, a, mark, a remarkable difference between that and this study that was shown. Also, increased risk for death. And so, you know, making the case again that patients who have you know, dementia, cognitive impairment, these are the people who you need to think about having post-operative problems. You need to identify them beforehand to help prepare. I love this test as a way to be able to do a screen for things. It's the mini cog test. Have them draw a clock. Just look at the clock and see how, how, how deformed the clock is. And what's also good to play a little bit off of a Fernando's talk too, it helps improve communication and helps in, include people in the conversation, sometimes family members who aren't comfortable talking about this. You have an objective scale here you can put in the chart that people can reference afterwards. And it's a great way to kind of start the conversation as to sometimes whether or not people even need surgery as, or where they could benefit from the surgery based on the projected recovery. So moving along, let's talk about organ systems. Uh, pulmonary assessment. Um, when I grew when I was coming up, uh, pulmonary assessment was a chest x-ray. Everybody got a chest x-ray. And, and we've moved really far beyond that now, kind of looking at more at stratification here. So medical risk factors, you know, anybody over the age of 60, you can see the list here, um, things you typically think about. And also think for us uh, urologists to involve when we talk about the team, like how long is the case going to be? And that's one of the things that three to four hours, it's a different anesthesia risk. And so really I think it's helpful sometimes even the notes to mark this and to be able to talk to the patients about it. Now, obviously abdominal emergent surgeries are higher than less invasive cases, but again, improving the conversation here. There's a risk calculator that I'm not recommending that people do this calculation for it, but take a look at it. It sometimes helps to be able to speak the language of preoperative assessment, and I find you're much more included in these, to sit in these conversations if you can discuss the tools that are being used and sometimes use the same language. Specifically for pulmonary, we're going to call out obstructive sleep apnea as something here, and uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Dr. Mulhall's uh, uh, talk earlier, I wanted to expand on this a little bit too. Um, this is a very important preoperative assessment. Um, somewhat prevalent, 10% of men and women have it, but the anesthesiologists are, are very keyed in on this, and this is something we found going through the literature, and it has significant perioperative morbidity from essentially airway collapse. And sometimes this is the difference between whether or not a case is done in an ambulatory surgery center versus an inpatient OR hospital. It has to do with the risk of airway collapse for, uh, uh, for patients. And you know, what can you do? How can you identify this to get them worked up for it? These are the three questions that really kind of rose to the top, and it's just ask if they're snoring, and you can ask a partner with that. They wake up short of breath. Uh, uh, are they have excessive fatigue during the day? You know, they're constantly falling asleep, and this should key you in a little bit to be thinking about this. Uh, the sleep study, uh, uh, as mentioned before, can be done in a sleep center at home, but the treatment is CPAP, and I think that the patients who have CPAP or have tried, treated before are less risk interoperatively, and the anesthesiologists actually like to have people on a treatment program before surgery. So this is a potentially modifiable risk factor. Moving on, you know, what isn't necessarily as helpful? Well, you know, PFTs, I think we tend to reflexively get these sometimes, but they're really only to change for our baseline when there's an impairment. Particularly somebody with COPD, you may be able to determine a change whether or not before and afterwards, but they're not good screening studies to understand kind of anesthesia risk or uh, perioperative morbidity. And so I use uh, PFTs based on our, our work group here really only to track status. 
Same thing with the chest x-ray, kind of very different for some of us who grew up in older systems here. But you know, really what came to light in the literature was that it's good to just establish a baseline for people of known disease. It's very uncommon to pick up something that uh, uh, changes the course of surgery as a, as a baseline screen. Now to some of the more tricky stuff, let's go on to cardiology. Um, EKG is the tool that most people are familiar with, with uh, for, car for cardiologists. But when going through the literature, um, what's very interesting about this is that it's not really good for risk stratification. What it really is good for, again, tracking the status of known disease. So if somebody has something you can see listed here, arrhythmias, cardiovascular disease, cardio uh, uh, CAD, uh, it's good to determine what status they are for that, but it's not a great screening test for it. And so, you know, for the recommendations are the people who are low risk generally don't need an EKG. But that doesn't mean that people don't need a cardiac assessment. I don't want people to leave here in sense to say that they don't. Everybody needs a cardiac risk assessment prior to surgery. And maybe the better way to think about this, though, is performance status. And this is the way the cardiologists tend to look at it. You break them down into categories of poor, moderate, and excellent. If you read the criteria there, kind of somewhat skewed, oddly, to, to uh, housework and kind of things that you do around the house. But you, know, you kind of look at where do you categorize these people? And I think that's where urologists can really help kind of understand functional status in addition to the frailty part, is just knowing what is their activity. And that then really plugs into the risk calculators. And what they're really looking at is a major adverse cardiac event. And, and this is a greater than 1% risk of having an adverse event. And there's a, a calculator here, which is very, very helpful, again, to understand kind of how to speak the language on this. But essentially, pe uh, people who have a low risk of this uh, major adverse cardiac event don't really need a further cardiac workup. But the people who have high risk, the cardiologist needs to be involved. And there's algorithms for this. And uh, um, I think there, it's probably more than what this talk, it's in the white paper, it goes through a little bit further. But I think the take home point here is really, our job is to assess where they are in terms of their, uh, their performance, and then whether or not we think they're gonna be falling into high or low risk categories. Anticoagulation comes up a lot. And uh, um, when do you stop it? Who do you stop it for? Some of the key points here that I'll focus on is that who not to stop the uh, anticoagulation on. And this would be continue any type of dual antiplatelet therapy in anybody who has a bare metal stent for three months and for a drug eluting stent for at least 12 months. And this is also uh, uh, summarized in a different white paper. I think this is one of the key things on anticoagulation. So AFib comes up a lot. What do we do about AFib? Um, majority of patients, according to the literature, don't need uh, anticoagulation for bridging before urologic surgery. The exceptions are the people who are at risk for a thromboembolic uh, uh, event. And these are going to be people who are at high risk of stroke, people who have had previous DVT, they've had coronary stents, um, or they've had other kind of em uh, ev evidence of thromboembolic events. But most people actually don't need to have bridging for it. And I think this is also something that maybe we can help avoid putting people on bridging or doing unnecessary visits. And, you know, check with your anesthesia team also for it. Uh, but in general, the recommendations are most people in AFib don't need to be bridged. So diabetes also had some interesting uh, discussions a little bit earlier here. Um, I think diabetes is a, is a tremendously impactful risk uh, uh, factor that we should be looking at um, uh, before surgery. Um, I would recommend for people, based on the literature and the review here, is to get a hemoglobin A1C. Um, I think that's something that's tremendously important. It doesn't just track the glucose at the time of uh, uh, the preoperative assessment or right before surgery, but it's the several weeks beforehand. And so it's looking at their aggregate blood sugar control. And so it's really the, the control of their blood sugar over time is what's dangerous, not necessarily the individual uh, spike of it. And the more, um, uh, poor, the, the more poorly controlled their blood sugar is, the more likely they're going to have glycemic events, they get ischemia, decreases perfusion, they get fibrosis. Um, you know, great talk by Jesse earlier about uh, um, how things and can cause fibrosis in the corporal tissues. Same thing can happen in other tissues, particularly when there's poor glycemic control. Recommendation is for elective surgeries that they have their uh, hemoglobin A1C below 8%. Sometimes this can be very difficult. People have chronic UTIs. Um, sometimes you just can't get there. But that's the goal. Um, looking at the uh, uh, national health care system in, uh, in England, um, they recommend cancel elective surgery for anything, less, anything greater than 400. We tend not to do that here. But again, that may be your trigger for the day to really assess whether or not it's worth proceeding with the surgery. 
I consider early in the day. I have a chart also in the uh, uh, white paper about recommendations on when to stop or start insulin for it. But diabetes is a good one to remember. Steroids, in general, you really need to supplement steroids for, for people if they're taking prednisone 20 milligrams a day for at least three weeks. Other than that, um, most people, you can stop it before if it's a lower dose for it. People who have been on a higher dose, they do need some type of supplementation interoperative. Um, there's some question about steroids and GI bleeding. Um, really, I think that there's not really too much for people to worry too much about that. Uh, you can talk with your gastroenterologist about the risk, but it tends to be a minor impact. Talking about GI, uh, bowel preps is interesting and important to talk about. And to date, there's really no evidence that a bowel prep helps almost any urologic surgery. And the exception only is, is if you're going to use colon. There's good meta-analysis here looking at things where they gave a uh, uh, Nichols antibiotic prep beforehand. And for people using colon for you know, colon uh, uh, surgery, it changes the risk of wound infections. It doesn't change the anastomotic failure rate or intra-abdominal complications. It really just changes the risk of, of, uh, of wound complications. So really, the recommendation of the white paper is, is not to do any bowel preps unless there's a specific reason that you're trying to address. So let's finish up here with prehabilitation. So again, this is uh, I'm trying to identify modifiable risk factors here. Um, maybe the one that everybody can help with is, uh, and can talk with your patients about is smoking. Um, there is a clear relationship between stopping smoking and improved uh, or decreasing risk for people afterwards. And it's a 41% risk of pulmonary wound complications if you stop at least four weeks beforehand. Um, it's about 19% of reduction for each week stopped. And there's some controversy a little bit ago about whether or not you should actually stop it close to surgery because you may get some rebound uh, uh, edema. That's been looked at and really has not proven to be the case. So stopping any time, you, know, you get about 19% reduction in risk for each week. So encourage people to stop at any point in the preoperative process. Same thing with dieting. Um, I think that uh, uh, nutrition is also underappreciated as to how it contributes to post-operative success. Um, people who have a 10% weight loss uh, three months before, before surgery have been demonstrated to have a longer recovery. And so when we have uh, patients who have a high BMI and we're recommending them to lose weight before surgery, set that horizon about uh, six months in the future. Don't ask them to lose a lot of weight in a rapid time right before surgery because it might actually prolong the recovery. Um, you know, starvation associated with poor risk and uh, um, really look at kind of a planned elective if you're, if you're able to do for elective surgery. And to finish up here, just talking about nutrition, and there is a good kind of ERAS council uh, consensus, consensus statement put out in 2017 about how we really should be rethinking about this before surgery. Um, lean body mass, I think, is going to be increasingly important moving forward when we look at how to assess risk for people. And a good way to do that is actually looking at the psoas muscle on a CT scan. Um, the less lean um, body mass they have, the higher risk for complications that they have. And so rather than just looking at calories, you know, before surgery, nutritionists are really pushing more protein intake, and they're recommending uh, greater than 1.2 uh, grams per kilogram a day. And it's kind of a number just to throw out to people if you're asking what they can do to get ready for surgery, you know, make sure they keep their protein intake relatively high. Um, and interestingly also, there's a lot of controversy about when to stop NPO after midnight and all that. And there's more data to suggest that people should continue to keep drinking uh, are eating solid foods up to eight hours before and then continuing at least drinking some sugar drinks close to the time up to surgery about two hours beforehand. And so, sum up here, the preoperative care really is a team approach and, and our goal with the white paper here is to involve urologists more in that team. More that you can speak the language, be able to talk to your patients and get people ready for this a little bit. Um, you should really try to identify the high risk patients and get them the care beforehand or at least have those discussions with the family beforehand. Um, you can look at the white papers uh, uh, for a little bit more detail and you know, the things that you do in this uh, preoperative paper cross-thread with the intraoperative and postoperative uh, uh, papers also. So thanks for the time and uh, looking forward to talking about it more in this afternoon.